Hi, I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. Today I'm starting a new series covering the basics of a part that's in just about every analog electronic device. The operational amplifier, or op amp for short. Let's start at the very beginning. What is an op amp anyway? We can define an op amp as a high gain differential amplifier. We'll see just what we mean by high gain in a moment. By differential, we mean that an op-amp has two input terminals, and its output voltage is sort of proportional to the difference between the voltages at those two terminals. But an op-amp doesn't have all the nice properties of linearity or temperature stability that we've been trying to achieve over in the series on transistors. What it does have is a tremendously high gain and a phenomenally high input impedance. Let's breadboard a simple test circuit to see just how high that gain is. We'll use a voltage divider to supply the plus input and ground the minus input. I'll use a 25 turn trimmer in the middle here. The adjustment range will be plus or minus about half a volt, so each turn of the pot will be a little over 40 millivolts. That ought to be plenty of resolution to work out the gain. We'll hang voltmeters on the input and output ports to measure the voltage gain. So let's set this up on the breadboard and measure it on our cheap TL071 op amp. When I actually set it up, I found that my meter on the input was returning almost random values. I found that I had to add a fairly sizable capacitor between the input of the op amp and ground to calm it down. I used a 1 microfarad electrolytic. Even with that, when electrical things happened near the bench, like the HVAC system turning on and off, things would go haywire for a moment. But now I found I couldn't find a setting of the potentiometer that would give me a stable reading on the output of op amp that wasn't within a couple of volts of the power rails. It simply swung from rail to rail with the tiniest fraction of a turn. Looking at still frames from the video, I found that the swings happened anywhere between negative 50 and negative 120 microvolts. That says, fairly conservatively, that the gain of the op amp is 20 volts divided by 70 microvolts, or somewhere north of 300,000. And the data sheet for the TL071BC that I'm using promises a typical gain of 200,000. Just incredible. But all that I can say with confidence is that the gain is higher than I can measure. This test also shows that the input offset voltage, the voltage where this particular device would theoretically give zero output, is somewhere around negative 80 microvolts. That's pretty lucky. Without trimming, a TL071 will typically give an input offset of up to 20 or 30 times that. When we compare that offset with the measures we've had to take to buy us our simple transistor amplifiers, we see the op amp also wins on that front by a couple of orders of magnitude. These devices are almost magical compared with their discrete cousins. But what good is all this gain when it's temperature dependent and doesn't have a stable bias point? Well, if you'll allow me to digress a little bit, I'd like to tell you some history. In the 1920s, the Bell system was wrestling with the demand for long-distance telephones. If telephones were connected just through a switching system, the resistance of many miles of wire would reduce the voice signals to where they were inaudible. They needed amplification. AT&T had tried to solve the problem, first with carbon repeaters, devices that were essentially a speaker that shared its diaphragm with a carbon microphone and were deployed in massive racks all along the trunk lines, and then by simple vacuum tube amplifiers that replaced the carbon repeaters in similar massive racks. But they all suffered from the problem of distortion. The response to the amplifiers was nonlinear. Once a voice signal had passed through more than a handful of repeaters, it would be uninterrupted. But AT&T needed to send signals across the continent, and was even thinking about how transatlantic calls might travel by wire, a project that took the next quarter century to complete. A 29-year-old Bell Labs engineer named Harold Black had been thinking for six years about the problem. One day in 1927, as he was riding on a ferry across the Hudson River to work in Manhattan, he had a sudden insight. He could use an amplifier with excess gain and then use a feedback loop to linearize the amplifier's response. In the litter aboard the boat, 
He found a misprinted copy of the New York Times, with the back of one page almost entirely blank. He sketched his thoughts and equations on the page and signed and dated it. Four months later, he had demonstrated an amplifier that reduced distortion by a factor of 100,000, 50 decibels. The laboratory built a system simulating a 12,000-kilometer connection. It demonstrated excellent speech quality, despite having an aggregate attenuation of 10 to the power 1,200, 12,000 decibels, by having Black's amplifiers at regular intervals to reconstitute the signal. It was a technological triumph. Black and Western Electric applied for a patent forthwith. It was initially denied. The invention had no utility, said the patent examiner. The purpose of an amplifier was to amplify. Throwing away gain made no sense. It took ten years for the patent finally to be granted. But Black surely had the last laugh. Negative feedback is used in virtually every analog electronic device today. But what is this negative feedback that Black proposed? Well, we can define feedback as the process of feeding part of a circuit's output back to one of its inputs. And negative feedback means that the signal is fed around in such a way that a deviation in the output is pushed back toward a stable state. Positive feedback, on the other hand, would push a deviation in the output farther in the same direction. Feedback appears so much in electronics that the term has made its way into the popular culture, but the popular culture has warped it. We would think of the lady on the left as giving negative feedback, but in fact she might be giving positive feedback, negative feedback, or none at all, depending on what effect her remarks have on the output. We would think of the air traffic controller as giving positive feedback. He's affirming that the pilot is taking the right action. But in fact it's negative feedback. It's telling the pilot to move in the direction opposite to the deviation from the desired course. We think of popular speech, of negative feedback as being discouraging or rude, while positive feedback is nice. But in engineering, negative feedback is very nice. It keeps things under control. Positive feedback makes our circuit's output oscillate or take off for the power rails. Occasionally that's what we want, if we're building an oscillator, a comparator, or a trigger circuit. But most of the time, we want the output to settle to a stable value, so negative feedback is a very good thing. In fact, the combination of an op has phenomenally high gain, its astronomically high intermittent impedance, and negative feedback means that most of our circuit analysis using op amps can be simplified to just two rules. The op amp inputs draw no current, and the op amp output takes on whatever voltage is needed to keep the voltages of the inputs equal. Yeah, there's lots of stuff under the little asterisk, but most op amp circuits operate in such a way that we can simply ignore all that stuff. Let's see an op-amps feedback loop in action, using the simplest feedback network we can possibly imagine, a wire from the output to the minus input. I'll tie my function generator to the plus input, and hook up my oscilloscope to the op-amps input and output. Since the golden rules say the voltages of the two op-amp inputs should be equal, I expect that this circuit should be a nearly perfect voltage follower. Let's see if I'm right. Here's that circuit on a breadboard. I haven't much to say about it, because it's pretty simple. This DuPont wire is the feedback path from the op-amps output to the input. I'll power it up and give it a 1 volt sine wave from my function generator. As I claimed, the output on the lower trace is nearly a perfect replica of the input on the upper. Even the maximum and minimum voltages indicated on the scope match perfectly. There's precisely unity gain and zero voltage difference from the input to the output. A lot better than the emitter followers that we've been looking at over in the series on basic transistor circuits. Okay, now the first golden rule said that the inputs draw no current. That can't be right. Let's see what the input impedance of that follower really is. We'll run the same test that we did before, but this time I'll put a 10 megohm resistor in series with the function generator and see what the voltage drops to. I'm putting that 10 megohm resistor on the input and moving my function generator onto it. I'll power up the circuit in the function generator and repeat the measurement. The amplitude has fallen to about 52% of its previous value. That says that the input impedance of the amplifier is 10.7 megohms. 
That's a respectable input impedance for an amplifier. Time to start cleaning up this test. I'll disconnect my scope probe from the input. Wait, what? With the probe removed from the input, the output amplitude returned to exactly what it was before. I haven't been measuring the input impedance of the amplifier. I've been measuring the input impedance of my oscilloscope. For me to see absolutely no change in the peak-to-peak -peak voltage reading, the input impedance of the amplifier has to be at least about 500 megohms. It's not often that a 10x scope probe is a significant load on a circuit. The input resistance is higher than I can measure, but that's not the whole story. We should also have a look at the reactance. For all intents and purposes, the input of the op amp appears to be an open circuit in DC, but there's certainly some stray capacitance there. If I increase the frequency of the oscillator, I should be able to determine how much. The stray capacitance will function as an RC low-pass filter along with the 10 megohm input resistor. We have a formula for the corner frequency of an RC low-pass filter. We can measure the corner frequency, which is the frequency at which the amplitude has fallen by a factor of the square root of 2, and solve for the capacitance. So let's do that. I've learnt now not to probe the high impedance point at the op-amp input, but I do want to be able to do a phase measurement. So I'm adding another channel to the scope display, showing the sync output of the function generator. This output produces a square wave that transitions at the zero crossings of the sine wave. I'll increase the frequency on the function generator, and occasionally adjust the sweep rate of the scope, until the signal has dropped to 71% of its original amplitude. That happens about 1800 hertz. A quick calculation shows that the capacitance is about 8 picofarads. Experience tells me that one column of the breadboard has a stray capacitance of about 4 to 6 picofarads, so the op-amp's input looks to be 2 to 4. Let me just cross-check this measurement by looking at the phase. At the corner frequency, the phase of the signal should be delayed 45 degrees. I'll zoom in for a better look. Looks close enough. I was just trying for a rough guess at the capacitance. So the first golden rule seems to work. The input impedance of the op-amp appears to be at least a few hundred megohms in parallel with at most a few picofarads, near enough to be an open circuit for audio work. Let me clean up the stuff from the previous test. Now let's have a look at the output impedance. The output impedance of the op-amp itself is going to be hard to measure because of the feedback loop. But that output impedance isn't really important. I'm going to show you that the output impedance of the circuit, taken as a whole, is tiny because of the feedback loop. I'll put in a 10k resistor in series with the op-amp's output. Now a 10k output impedance would make for a pretty terrible amplifier, but let's keep going here. We'll close the feedback loop, and we'll load the output heavily by tying a 1k resistor to ground. Now you might think that the output voltage would only be 1 11th of the input voltage, because the resistors look like a voltage divider. But remember the second golden rule. The op-amp will try to do whatever is necessary to make the voltages at its inputs equal. Will it succeed in this case? Let's find out. I'll add that voltage divider to the output without yet changing the feedback path. And I'll set the scale on the scope to a tenth of the voltage per division. When I power it on, the voltage divider does indeed divide, and the output has one eleventh the voltage at the input. There's no real surprise here. A voltage divider divides. But when I move the jumper to place the divider inside the feedback loop, I have to change the scope's vertical scale back to what it was before. The output voltage is once again a perfect copy of the input. If I overlay the two traces, they lie precisely on top of one another. The second golden rule is working for us. So feedback has made the output impedance of the circuit as a whole very close to zero. But there's still a voltage divider here. 
So I want you to think about the question of what voltage the op-amp needs to be putting out in order to keep its inputs equal. It shouldn't be too hard a question for you to answer. Next time, we'll look at that answer and examine how to use an op-amp as a building block with an arbitrary stable gain. This time, we've learned about the golden rules for op-amp circuits, and we've looked at the op-amp follower, a circuit with unity gain, near-zero offset, a nearly infinite input impedance, and a nearly zero output impedance. As I just said, next time we'll start looking at how to make our follower into an amplifier with a different gain factor, and start thinking of other interesting things to do with feedback. I hope you'll stay tuned for that, and perhaps favor me with a subscription and ring the notification bell so that you don't miss it. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye!